All right, so this is our last session on operational risk and on other risk. Uh, well, we have a few other risks after this one. So, um, so I want to go through this article, Enterprise Risk Management. It's an interesting topic. You could actually Google that and several things would come up. Enterprise Risk Management, the thought there is to look at risk in a holistic way from the whole enterprise. We'll talk about this a little bit more from an individual standpoint. Uh, maybe not this class. We'll see. We might get into it. Uh, but enterprise risk management is don't look at risk in silos. Don't look at them individually. Look at them in total. How does everything work together? So it's essentially balance sheet immunization, but looking at all risks, not just interest rate risk. And so Glenn Holton, he's a famous guy in risk management. He has his own consulting business. He's written some articles I really like, especially his article, Defining Risk. I highly recommend you read that as in addition to this article. Uh, those are his two most famous articles. So here in Enterprise Risk Management, he says a good operational risk management system has three things. It has a good culture, has good procedures, and it has supporting strong technology. Um, now, in his article, it's it's almost humorous today, but he was talking about why did all these huge, spectacular losses happen? You could take every loss he lists, and they're smaller than what Morgan Stanley lost in one day. So, uh, the world keeps getting riskier, it keeps getting larger. And why is that? Why did the losses, why are we having these massive losses? So, even here, he was saying this is really unusual. Even when you adjust it for inflation and the size of markets, the losses we were seeing in the 1990s just dwarfed anything we saw before. And now today we're seeing losses that dwarf anything we saw in the 90s. And so the question is, what is going on? Are people um, more unethical? Are they just taking bigger risks? What's going on? And so he mentioned some of these, these areas. So Orange County lost $1.7 billion. We're going, we're going to talk about this one later. Barings Bank, that's the one I was talking about before, Nick Leeson, uh, the oldest bank in the, in the UK, the Queen's Bank, and this one person took it under. Orange County, one person brought that firm under. Dalway Bank, just a small number of people caused a $1.1 billion loss. Sumitomo Corporation, one person caused a $1.8 billion loss. And you add these together and Morgan Stanley lost a lot more than that. So what is going on and so what is changing is now one person can do far more harm than they could do in the past that's why I said under operational risk I sat down and asked how could I destroy my company they had given me the ability with just a phone call to do tremendous harm to my company that did not make sense you, you shouldn't have one person with that kind of power but that's what's happening and why is it well a lot of it has to do with the leverage that comes from derivatives. We talked about interest rate swap. So remember when I did the interest rate swap, the market value of it was zero. So it went on our books at zero, but we had the exposure as if I had purchased $3 billion in assets. And I could have done a lot more than $3 billion. And the $3 billion is what we did because that's what we needed to immunize our balance sheet, but no one gave me any restrictions on how much I could have done. No one was checking or double checking the numbers. Um, so you have something that comes on the books at zero. No one worries about it. The accountants don't worry about it because it's it's there's no value there. And yet your firm's market value, their net worth is going to swing around as, as if you just invested $3 billion. And so that leverage is just unheard of, whether it's options or swaps or futures, produces enormous leverage. It's not necessarily that people are, are they've got bad employees now or we used to have good employees. It's just that we have tools that are far more devastating. I know Warren Buffett has talked about how he hates derivatives because he, he just thinks they're a recipe for destruction. There is something to that, but at the same time, derivatives, because they're so levered, a little bit of derivatives can mask a lot of risk and we we talked about that when we we're doing the Robert Arnott you could just do some derivatives to, to handle the risk of those very longest uh, duration liabilities for your pension plan you can eliminate a lot of risk with just a little bit of interest rate swaps it's pretty amazing and so I think they're great things in the right hands and they're 
they're ticking time bombs, derivative instruments. If you're not familiar with derivatives, derivatives include essentially futures and options. That's the entire world. world. Deri derivatives. Futures is an obligation to do something. Options, you have the option to do something. You have the right to do something. So when you enter into a future, you have to do something. So interest rate swaps, futures. Um, so this is futures, forwards, and swaps. You are obligated to do something. Whereas options, which include call options and put options, you have the right to do something, but you don't have to do it. Um, futures are very dangerous because they're very levered. It doesn't matter whether you're buying them or selling them. You have just in, this incredible risk. Options, if you're buying options, the nice thing about options is they do go on your books at market value, whatever you pay for the option, and that's the most you can lose. However, if you're, if, however, if you're selling options, your losses are practically unlimited. So there's a lot of derivatives um, that can really do incredible destruction to an entity if they're not executed correctly. We're going to talk about futures and forwards when we talk about the MG case a little bit later and see how that uh, that applied there. So <clears throat> the large losses that these entities saw could have been prevented with just decent oversight. Good constraints, good compliance tools. Um, but what happened was these firms went almost unchecked mainly because people did not want to admit they didn't understand the complexity of what these traders were doing. Um, so it was, yeah, it was, uh, part of it was just ego. Bar Barings Bank is a good example. Ba the, the trader at Barings Bank was doing things and no one really understood what he was doing. And so they let him let him be. And in fact, at one point, he thought the gig was up because they told him he, he had a reputation for being their best trader. While he was destroying the company, they thought he was their best trader. So at one point, Nick Leeson was asked to come to New York to make a presentation because he was so famous in the firm. And he thought, I can't do that. If they make me go to New York, I can't keep my trades going that are hiding all my losses and they'll find me out and I'll be done for it. So he actually told his management, I can't come to New York unless you set up a Bloomberg terminal for me so I can continue trading. And so they did that for him. So they, they could have shut him down at that point. That's one of the risk management techniques is to require people in finance to take two week vacations so that if they are doing something, it'll blow up on them while they're on their vacation. And so, um, but he had an auditor come in to audit him, and he, the auditor should have found him out, but the auditor was so enamored with Nick Leeson and his, the complexity of what he's doing, he didn't do his job. So regulators, rating agencies, they need to demand better risk management tools, but they tend to focus on the past, not on the next thing. So ultimately, in a crisis, that's when you find out if you're doing something right or wrong and in a crisis. Many times, survival is the only thing that, that matters. So I want to get into Glenn Holton's uh, article here. I'm going to take a quick break to uh, fix a file that I, I need to load, and then we'll come back to this. All right, so what does Glenn Holton say about culture, culture procedures and technologies? And first in culture, he says that's the fundamental problem in these companies. Their culture is inadequate for confronting irresponsible behavior. Um, behavior that reduces organizational risk oft often creates personal risk. So someone wants to say, hey, uh, I think what you're doing is, is dangerous. You shouldn't do it. You, maybe you're in the risk management department or maybe you're an entry level person. You notice the boss is doing something that you think is dangerous. Um, you could lose your job. You could be called out to be an alarmist. Um, so it's, it's, it's just a tough industry because of the egos going on to actually confront. So you want a culture that allows confrontation. You need to be able to rock the boat, ask questions, challenge the establishment. One thing I really loved with working with Bob Davis at USAA is he wanted people to bring up these issues. He wanted people asking questions. 
Um, and one of the techniques he's had, he had that you might want to try is whenever a decision was about to be made, he would go around the entire room and ask each person individually, do you, do you think this is right? Do you think this is what we would do? And, and many, many times there was someone there sitting, not sure they had a question, but it looked like everybody was moving toward making the decision. They were bring up the question and it would sideline the issue and they would say, well, let's talk about it some more and let's resolve that. It was frustrating to me at times because I almost had something approved and then one person would ask a question and I'd have to go back and meet with them again. But I like that. It was before we make this decision, let's make sure this isn't groupthink. Let's make sure everyone's issues are out on the table. Culture defines what's condoned and what is shunned. So if if people are shunned for bringing up asking asking questions, rocking the boat, then that's going to make the culture more, much the company much more uh, risky. Um, so one key with the good corporations individuals are responsible for decisions not groups not the committees um, now i worked in a company that committees ran everything that was very much to my advantage because when committees run everything if you code to committee meetings prepared it gives you tremendous power you can really get control over a lot of projects because a lot of people go to committee meetings just to waste time and to get some free coffee but if you go prepared it, it can work well, but it's not good for the corporation because then when something goes wrong, there's no one who's accountable. A lot of questioning and people willing to admit they really don't have everything figured out. I think that's important. So the culture is important and then procedures, the purpose of procedures is to address this personal, this personal risk that people are taking. You want procedures to empower people. So if you don't want to approach your boss and say, hey, I think what you're doing is too risky, you can at least approach your boss and say, hey, we can't do that. It, it, it uh, violates procedures. Um, so procedures help um, a lot, but the success of procedures really depend on the risk culture. Um, the lack of procedures increases personal risk. Reducing uncertain pr uncertainty procedures reduce that individual risk, and they promote action. Organizations also need to have a process for changing procedures. Uh, one thing that really was unsettling for me when I, when I became a portfolio manager, the compliance department came in to meet with me and they brought in these two notebooks that were just massive. Oh, they were several thousand papers, pages, massive, massive. And they put them on my desk and say, here's your, here's your compliance procedures. And it was like, there's no way I'm reading all of this. <laughs> it just was not... There was no practical way I was going to sit down and learn all of those procedures. Uh, they had procedures for me to sign off on things that I didn't even understand. Is I'd read them and I, so I go back to compliance and say, "What am I signing off on? What does this mean?" And they didn't know what it meant. They just wanted me to sign, and I said, "I'm not signing off on something if I don't know what it is." When we finally figured out what it is, I discovered they were having me sign off on one very small thing that I did. So I would sign off, but when I signed off, I would sign off with my name and with a comment that I was only signing off for that one thing. That everything else that was alluded to and what I was signing off on, I didn't have responsibility for because there was other portfolio managers doing that piece. So, um, you know, there's a lot of just going through the motions on procedures where there's actually no risk management going on at all. Um, you don't want to start with what the regulators say or the ratings you say. Their focus is on risk minimization. Your low focus is on risk optimization. There's things that you want to do, even though they're risky because you're getting paid to take the risk. So they are risky. Ratings agencies and regulators don't want you to do that, but you need to do it to optimize the value of the firm to your stockholders. And then there's technology, and you got to make sure you're not buying technology because it's cool and fancy. You got to make sure that technology is being bought to to do risk management um, the way you want to do it. That it's set up to help you do what you want to do with risk management. That you don't buy the technology and then say, "Hey, let's see if we can use this for risk management." You figure out what you want to do with risk management, and then you go find the technology. Actuaries, especially, really bad at this. Actuaries love fancy tools and models. You got to first make sure. <laughs> The risk management culture and procedures are in place first. Um, 
the, mo the most difficult part of technology is actually getting the data. And today with artific artificial intelligence and machine learning, there's, there's more and more things we're doing that are getting this better. But it's still, the data is out there, but it's not always in the right form. It's not always accessible. It might be complex. People might have data in, in different kind of categories. And you might have the same title for a piece of data, but it's very differently defined between the departments. So trying to get the data on a consistent basis is very different, different, difficult. You got to make sure that risk is a prospective thing. So your risk management can't just rely on technology for pulling historical data. So you've got to do something that at least shows you where you're going next. Uh, that's why I like that phrase, garbage in, gar gospel out. Sometimes technology looks so sophisticated, looks so complex. However, it's it's doing doing more harm than good because it's really it's the sophistication hides the fact that it's 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 fairly weak. So, all right. So a few examples um, on operational risk. I like this British Petroleum one. In 2010, British Petroleum had a major oil spill. You may not remember it, but it was major in the news. So I read an article about British Petroleum, and they said, hey, we had all these lessons learned. So we finally, we finally learned our lesson. And they said the spill was a perfect storm of aging infrastructure. So we weren't taking care of our machinery. And part of that reason was because we were really big on cost cutting. We weren't looking at risk. We were looking at trying to get our margins up. And that caused us to allow our infrastructure to get out of shape. We had a risk management process, but it was more form over substance. They were just going through the motion. We had some close calls. We had some almost big accidents that we just ignored. There were good warning signs. We're too focused on profits more than safety. It was an overarching failure risk management or culture. It's just that we got too focused on one thing. Although I would say that is, that is the overarching failing, failing of this. Um, so here's all their lessons learned. However, I'm lying to you. The article I read from British Petroleum wasn't about the April 2010 oil spill. It's an article I found in November 2006. And for some reason, I kept that article where they're talking about the lessons learned they had, they had had from those losses they had well before 2010. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how bad we are at this. So who said this? You've got the answer right here, Joseph Cassano, but in 2008, September 2008, what did he say? It is hard for us without being flippant to see a scenario, any scenario, with any kind of realm of reason that would see us losing one dollar in any of those transactions. We're sitting on a great balance sheet, strong investment portfolio, and a global trading platform where we can take advantage of the market in a variety of places. Who said that? AIG. The, the founding member and head of AIG's financial products units. Exactly the part that blew up on AIG. And he's saying, hey, we can't see any scenario. Well, obviously, they weren't running enough extreme scenarios to see how that AIG unit that was selling credit default swaps couldn't see how that unit could blow up on them. So you see how, and this is no, this is an impressive guy. He's very quantitative, definitely understands risk, understands finance. Um, this is not a stupid person, a very smart person, and yet you can see even the best in our business can have incredible blind spots. <laughs> Uh, all right, so what I want to do next class, so this is it for class 19. In class 20, I want to continue with operating, uh, operational risk. Uh, I want to walk through an article that talks about why we're, we're, we're somewhat weak at this. And then there's a few other things I want to talk about with operational risk um, related to some of my history with USAA. And just to get, I want to get your feedback. I, I wish we were in class because I really wanted to do this in class, but we'll see if we can do this. Um, else, you know, with the videos, or maybe we'll have a class session. We'll see.